to get started. First of all, thanks a lot for attending this session. I know it's a really long walk uh, down the hallway. Uh, I'm Chetan Dandekar. I'm product manager for AWS. And I have Kapan Brinkley from Intuit with me today to talk about AWS CloudFormation. If you are just considering using CloudFormation at, at this point, we have a quick recap of why you should use CloudFormation. If you are already a user, then Capon has some great tips to share with you. And if you have been a CloudFormation user for a while, and if you have been given us feedback, then we have made some improvements based on your feedback. And I have a highlight of those improvements for you. And finally, at the end of the session, we'll have some time for questions and answers. So let's start with why one should use CloudFormation. Most of us in this room today have a responsibility to manage infrastructure stacks like this one. This could be an online real estate website for buying and selling homes. There is data store at the back. There is the app tier for doing long running processing, like putting together offers. There is the web servers for serving web content. And then there are more resources, like the S3 bucket for static images, the CloudWatch alarm, and so on. How do you make sure that these diverse moving pieces are provisioned in the right manner, and then they continue to work together well? There is obviously one way, which is reading lots of instruction manuals, and then putting together long scripts. I know everyone in this room loves coding. But if you go down that path, there are lots of questions that you need to answer. What should be the creation order? Can the load balancer be created before auto-scaling group? Or should it be after? Or could those two things be created at the same time? What are the provisioning errors that you can recover from? And then what are the errors that you should not uh, retry for? How long you should wait between creation of, say, the database and the servers? Will that script work again? in the same or a different environment? Can the script be faster? And so on. And if you're using CloudFormation, you do not have to worry about any of that. And the reason is CloudFormation lets you model this architecture in a template file. And then with just a few clicks or commands, CloudFormation creates that architecture for you. Personally, it reminds me of a 3D printer printing a nice complex object for you out of a CAD diagram. Except that CloudFormation doesn't stop at creation. It helps you manage and updates, update those resources going forward. When you are building an application stack like the one we saw, you want to be able to replicate that again and again, obviously through dev, test, and production environment, but also maybe having a stripped down version for demos, or creating a, say, a version of the stack for a new region that your business is going in. And if you're packaging your application in a CloudFormation template, then this replication is really easy. Just a few clicks and just a few minutes, and you recreate that stack exactly like it was before. And replication is also useful in some other scenarios. Uh, for example, if your company has a policy to have standard VPC configuration, that everybody in the company should use, you can make their lives very easy if you give them a template, a CloudFormation template, that has that VPC configuration, and they can go and reuse that. If your company uses an IT service catalog, which dispenses out compute clusters for university researchers, for example, you can use CloudFormation as a building block which creates those environments that the IT service catalog can go and dispense. And finally, if you are doing provisioning and management again and again, you would obviously want to automate that process. And CloudFormation is built for that automation. We have customers today who have built their build pipelines to create CloudFormation templates along with their regular code building. And then they call CloudFormation APIs to create stacks. And then finally, they can monitor the stacks using CloudFormation APIs or any other monitoring mechanism. 
And one of our customers who have mastered this art of automating on top of CloudFormation is Intuit. And we have Capen from Intuit today, so let's listen to him on how they use CloudFormation. Thank you. Thank you, Chayton. Um, that's a great compliment coming from you guys being the creator of such an awesome product such as CloudFormation. Um, uh, one logistical thing, um, you guys are either a very patient group so far or you're just getting over your uh, food coma from lunch. Um, we're going to have a quick time for Q&A at the end of the session. So um, if, if you have a question, try and save it for that. And if you do, try and use the microphones up there so it can uh, be on the recording and we don't have to uh, repeat the question as it comes about. Um, so good afternoon. Thanks, everybody, for being here. My name is Capen Brinkley. I'm a software engineer at Intuit. Um, they make uh, a number of products, uh, some of them being QuickBooks, TurboTax, Mint, Quicken. You may have heard of a few of those. Um, and the company's goal is to improve customers' financial lives so profoundly that they can't imagine doing it the old way. Now, being a level 200 class, um, I would assume that most people in the audience have a basic understanding of what cloud formation is, and you probably use it in some form or fashion. Um, what I'd like to share with you guys today is how we've taken that basic knowledge um, into, um, and transform that into managing large-scale applications. In doing that, I'm going to share with you um, some of the principles that we adhere to along the way um, and some of the tools we use into creating truly dynamic infrastructures. So my story is going to be about how we made this transformation with an application called Live Community. Um, and uh, in doing that, I'll be covering four core sections. I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about how we do infrastructure design. Um, I'm going to talk about how we do template management for cloud formation templates, uh, how we do stack management, managing those stacks within cloud formation. And lastly, I'm going to talk about how we do instance bootstrapping using auto scaling groups and tooling that cloud formation provides that enables that for us. Now, how do, um, a little background on the Live Community product. Um, Live Community is a question and answers knowledge based platform used by 17 Intuit products and growing today. Uh, you can essentially think of it as like a Stack Overflow or a Quora uh, for Intuit products that's powered by our own team of engineers. Uh, and what you're seeing here is an example of the TurboTax answers exchange. So if I'm a customer on the TurboTax site and I'm anywhere on the site and I click the Help button, I'm taken here and that's all powered by our live community product. Now, how do we even get to AWS? Well, being that TurboTax is one of our customers, they drive a really unique seasonal load pattern for us. Um, here you can see a very high level of what that traffic pattern looks like coming from TurboTax. Uh, there's a, a peak that happens in February when W2s come out, and then there's this uh, massive peak that happens in mid-April from all of you late tax filers in the audience trying to get questions answered, and then it kind of tapers off and it goes through the year. So um, the way we were managing this four years ago is we would essentially buy all the hardware we needed just to service these two peaks. And the unfortunate byproduct of that was that 80% of our hardware was sitting idle for 80% of the time. Obviously, a completely inefficient cost model. Essentially, live community is the poster child for EC2's primary use case. Um, so we got some buy-in, and then we went to AWS. These are the services we were using the first day we got there. We're using EC2. We're using uh, S3, RDS, and elastic load balancing. And um, it was essentially, operationally, it was like we just took our data center and we just dropped it in AWS. And even when we got out there, uh, doing things were extremely hard. Everything was completely manual and painful. Um, things were completely highly error prone. And uh, quite honestly, we just spent the majority of our time doing nothing but trying to keep the infrastructure up and running. And so the team sat back and said, okay, we need to, um, we need to make a change. We need to do... Um, we need to have better operations around this. We really need to start taking advantage of things that AWS offers us and what the community might offer this. And so part of that game plan was we were going to start leveraging uh, Chef for our configuration management framework, and we were going to start um, using CloudFormation. So that brings us to our first improvement, and that's infrastructure as code. Hopefully a lot of you have heard this. Now, in using Chef, um, Infrastructure as code is just something that's ingrained to that product and the configuration management culture as a whole. As a whole. So we were already there and doing that. And um, we started to see some instant benefits from that, like creating instant, uh, repeatable instance builds. Um, 
we had far less errors in the environment, and uh, we knew we had a really good idea of what was happening when and where. And now with CloudFormation, being is that you present uh, templates uh, to the service in a JSON format, so you can provision your stack. Um, we figured, hey, there's no reason why we can't treat this the same way. So that's exactly what we did. Um, what you can see here is a snapshot of our CloudFormation templates repo. Um, we have all of the different templates that model out our infrastructure today. Uh, and like, just like with any code, every change is peer reviewed before it's actually merged into master and used into production. Um, and, uh, but it wasn't always this pretty. You're seeing the end result of this. <laughs> Let me tell you about our first CloudFormation uh, experience. So we had two developers working on, on, on it at the time. Their names were Tommy and Brett. And so they were looking at CloudFormation, and Brett said, and they say, hey, we think we can leverage this. Looks like there's some benefits here. Uh, and uh, Brett just loves to go in and hack. So he looks at Tommy and says, Tommy, I'm going to take the first crack. I want to make this happen. So Tommy says, OK. And when Brett gets serious about something, dude goes dark. Never see him. So he disappears. We don't even know where he is. We're going to lunch. We're like, what happened to Brett? I don't know. Can't find him. Two weeks later, he comes running out. He goes, Tommy, 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 look, 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 I've done it. Here it is. And so this is Brett with our first CloudFormation template. And he goes, Tommy, Tommy, look, I've done it. I've just provisioned the entire live community development environment using CloudFormation and automated the entire thing. Look it, it's right here. Isn't it awesome? And Tommy goes, OK, yeah, sure, that's awesome. Let's take a look. So Tommy takes a look, and he goes, dude, this is like a 2,000-line JSON template. And Brett goes, yeah, it's fantastic, isn't it? We did the whole thing. It's automated, right? We're perfect. Tommy says, mm, OK, well, let's take a look. And so he, he digs in. And he goes, OK, I'm on line 932. And I see you're you know, uh, modeling out our auto-scaling group for our application tier. And um, so what happens if we want to um, add another auto-scaling group? Maybe we have a different function we want to add, or maybe we want to have a different app tier. And Brett kind of starts to think about it and goes, hmm, I don't know. We're going to have to figure that out. And so Tommy keeps digging through, gets to like line 1,752, and says, OK, I see we have um, an RDS uh, parameter group in here, so we're trying to map that out. What happens if we need to change some values within a database? How are we going to manage that on a day-to-day -day basis and function? And Brett goes, I don't know. We're going to have to figure that out. And so what we realized really quickly was that we were going to have some operational challenges um, uh, moving forward if we didn't figure out some way to manage this. And these large templates, just like large code bases, are really hard to manage. Um, so that got us grounded on uh, our next couple of concepts. The first one being service-oriented architecture. And so as we started to model things out with CloudFormation, we realized that uh, that's really what we were creating. And we got really grounded. We were like, hey, we're building SOA here. And so let's start to do that. Let's start, start to make it look that way. And so. Um, that's the way we treat it today. Every uh, auto-scaling group that provides some service or function is behind a load balancer. And every layer within our architecture um, has some sort of an endpoint to minimize uh, uh, and makes configuration a lot easier. Uh, and that design made it really nice for us to start swapping out our implementation of services with what AWS had. Now you can see we use a lot more services today. Um, because of this new design, the other advantage that we had was if we wanted to switch out our implementation with what AWS was, it wasn't this painful process. It was pretty painless. So take Elastic Cache, for example. We were able to take our memcache um, implementation and cut over to Elastic Cache pretty easily just by changing the endpoint. Um, and the other benefits we got out of that was we're managing less code because we're not managing the configuration for our memcache tier anymore. And we're managing less instances. We're just leveraging the service, using what AWS provides us. Let them do the heavy lifting on that. So we've got, um, we're taking advantage of the different services now. Um, we've got our, our stacks are becoming more apparent. And this got us ground on the concept of how we actually wanted to manage this and how the code was going to come out. And so we use the term multiple templates loosely coupled. And so what you can see here, and, and what it translates to, is that every layer um, within our architecture essentially becomes a stack. And so I can model those out, and I can manage a template around that. So for example, I have an SQS queue. I have an app auto-scaling group. I have an RDS stack that manages all that. 
And um, what we really got to is we got two primary benefits out of this. The first one being that everything was really easy to reason about. So for example, if I wanted to do something with an ELB, um, I'm no longer waiting through this 2,000 line JSON template. I'm going to my Cloud Formation Templates repo. I'm going to the ELB template. I'm working with maybe about 60 lines of code instead of 2,000. Uh, so that makes it really easy. Um, another benefit in that is that if I'm doing work on an ELB, I no longer, I, I, I have um, a high level of confidence that there's no way I'm gonna impact what's going on with my RDS stack, because they're completely decoupled. Um, and that's the other part, is they also have their own life cycles. So your infrastructure is not revs the same, right? So I may change Elastic Cache once a month, once every other month, um, but I may change my application tier frequently, multiple times a day potentially, depending on what's going on. And so these different stacks and these different uh, parts of your architecture have their own uh, life cycle about them. And by managing it this way for us, it was really easy to get things done. Uh, the second major benefit was reusability. Um, so we heavily leverage input parameters uh, from CloudFormation and outputs to basically wire everything together across the architecture. Um, an example of that is, I'll use the EOB as an example again. If um, I can have 20 EOBs in my environment, and because I can change uh, parameters um, when I provision that stack, say, like um, what my health check endpoint looks like, uh, timeout values, something like that, I could manage 20 different stacks or EOB stacks with one template, and that's all I need. Uh, another advantage from reusability, like I said, Intuit has a lot of different products. We have a lot of different business lines. We've now developed a core-based set of CloudFormation templates that if a group's looking to go to AWS, we can take that, hand it off to them, and give them a base start. Maybe some, save them a few, few weeks of pain in terms of trying to figure out how they want those to look. So just as in technology, everything is not without its trade-offs. We had one major trade-off that we had to figure out with this, and that's stack management. So basically, with stack management, we have our decoupled stacks. We have source control around them. Everything's great, but we have a ton of stacks, so how are we going to manage this stuff? Um, first thing we did uh, is we tried using the console, and it was, it was pretty much the same uh, experience that my, some of you might be familiar with in terms of how you manage instances. Okay, I'm going to go on the console. I'm going to provision some instances. How does that feel? Um, okay, I need some more power. I'm going to try the command line tools. Um, you know, and so you move on, maybe wrap some scripts around that. And that was kind of the same progression we were going through with CloudFormation. Um, and we were using some open uh, source deployment frameworks as well to try and wire it all together. Um, but we were really missing some advanced level things that we really needed to help make it easier for us. Um, two of those being, um, because we have multiple business lines and products, we have to manage a lot of different accounts in a lot of different regions. And so we needed a way to seamlessly do that. You can do it with the command line tools, but it, it wasn't seamless for us. And um, Another one is uh, a concept called cloning and cloning a stack. I'm going to share with you how we do that in a little bit. Um, and um, so we ultimately ended up going out and creating an open source uh, tool called Simple Deploy, which unfortunately it's not aptly named because its primary focus is to manage cloud formation stacks. And so it's a little bit misleading in the name. But nonetheless, that's what it does. You can do all the primary functions. You can list stacks. You can create them. You can destroy them. You can even update them. Um, but it gives you those extra things of managing multiple accounts and regions pretty uh, easily. And it can even give you the ability to clone. Um, another thing it allows you to do is chain output parameters from stacks, or outputs from stacks, and use those as input parameters into other stacks, or inject your own parameters into stacks when you provision these. So, Here's a list of all the commands that Simple Deploy does today. Uh, I'm going to take you through a typical app deployment for us um, to illustrate a basic use case of how we use Simple Deploy on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, in doing that, I'm only going to cover these five separate commands. We're going to talk a little bit about environments. I'm going to talk about the list command. And I'm going to describe to you the difference between the create and the clone. And uh, lastly, cover the destroy. Before we do that, a little background on the type of deployment we do, just so you can have context as we're walking through it. Um, we use a blue-green style deployment. 
So what we have here is an EOB stack that's running our, our front end. Underneath it, we have our, another stack, which is our app tier. It's an auto-scaling group, and that's our blue group. In this case, it's running version 1.0.0. Um, and so we want to do a, uh, we want to do an upgrade to version 1.1. So what we do, we provision another stack, another auto scaling group, with the version of code that we want. The instances start coming up online. They start taking traffic from the ELB. We start to redirect traffic. Does the thing look good? If they don't, we go back to blue. But let's say in this case, everything's looking fantastic for us. So we gradually redirect everything over to the green group. And at that point, we're completely and solely on our green group. And then with that, we have no more use for the blue group. So you know what? We're just going to completely destroy it. Treat it like trash. Don't care. We'll get another one someday. It's fantastic. Green group becomes the blue group. Rinse, wash, repeat. Cycle continues. That's how we do our deployments. So in doing that, I, I need to provision version 1.1. So like I said, we have multiple accounts, multiple regions. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to go out and look at my environments. Um, and so you can see in the listing here, I've got a pre-prod account, I've got a prod account, and I haven't provisioned this anywhere before. So I'm going to do it in my pre-prod account. And let's say I'm going to tackle West 1 as the first region where I'm going to test this out. So what I'm going to do from there is I'm going to use the list command, and I'm going to tell it what environment I want to use. So what you can see here is I'm getting a listing of the CloudFormation stacks where I, that I have in there. For my dev environment, you see I have the EOB, I have the app group, I have a DB master and a DB parameter group that we manage. That alludes to the fact that this is an RDS instance, and this is how we manage this. Um, so from there, we have two separate options. Now, we can do a create, uh, which I'll show you, or we can do the clone. So the first option is to do a create to get uh, that app2 stack out there. So what, a high level of what that looks like, I do a create, pass it the environment, I give it the name, app2. I give it the template I want to use with that, app.json. Again, one template. I can manage, I can create application groups all day, and I don't need different templates to do it. Um, I use that input stack switch that essentially leverages outputs from other stacks. So in this case, for the ELB, I'm saying, hey, what's that ELB? I need to tell my instances to come up online after that when, they're, when they come up online. And then from a database perspective, hey, what's my RDS endpoint? How do I even tell my app instances how to get to my database? So I'm injecting that. Um, and you can see with the attribute switch, I'm basically injecting my own parameters and saying, hey, here's the artifact ID that I want you to do to download my infrastructure code or my chef repo and to download my application code. So this is a cleaned up version of a create. Like I said, we use a lot of different parameters and switches, and we could be calling multiple stacks depending on what's going in there. And this is where simple deploy becomes really not so simple because a create command can just like get longer than I can actually stretch my arms out to be um, as you're trying to manage that. So, we came up with the clone command, and that's the other alternative we have, and that's typically what we do uh, when we already have something up and running. So using a clone command, um, similar process, pass it the environment. We're now calling a source stack. So what we're saying in that is saying, hey, I've got a stack out there. I want that exact same template that that guy's running. I want to have all the input, all the parameters that he has um, so I can leverage that. And I'm going to use that to clone that and create a completely identical stack. But I'm going to also give it two more switches. I'm going to pass in the attributes for my artifact IDs because I need to change that code. That's the only thing I want changed. It's all simplified in the create. I don't have to worry about messing something up because I'm trying to change 30 different parameters or trying to get the right stack input in there. I just want to change two simple things, be done with it. And so that's what we do. So like I said, app two comes up online. And then from there, no use for it. So we're just going to destroy it, give it the environment, pass it the app name, and it's gone. So I mentioned to you that instance, instances are coming up uh, and, and coming online underneath the ELB. Um, uh, I'm sure you probably figured out by now that that all happens without user interaction. If you didn't, it does. Um, but what we have here is pretty much the high level of the process that gets us to the point where we need to do bootstrapping. So we've provisioned our CloudFormation stack. We've called that. Our auto-scaling group is kicking in. And the instances are coming up online. So from there, what we do is we leverage user data. We basically inject a little bit of bash code to get us to the point where we can actually start to leverage 
the CloudFormation init helper resource um, that basically allows us to, um, it's a more sophisticated, more declarative configuration management framework than if we were to just run bash code uh, through user data. Um, and that gets us to the point where we run Chef. Again, we're only going to use CloudFormation init just enough so we can get to Chef. Chef is our single source of truth when it comes to configuring the instance. Unfortunately, it doesn't magically happen on its own. So we need those user data and CloudFormation init in the process to make sure that that happens. Um, so I'll walk you through how we do user data and CloudFormation init, give you a high level of what that looks like. So what you can see here is I'm modeling out what I want user data to look like in my CloudFormation template. And what that translates to on every instance, calling that special loopback interface. So we're going to take that bash code, and we're going to say, hey, I need the CFN um, helper scripts so I can call CloudFormation um, resource within that template using the, the CFN init uh, script. So that gets us to CloudFormation init. Here's the different resources you can use. There's eight different ones. Um, config sets is kind of more of like a uh, super um, set resource, and then the other ones are a little bit more directive. So like I said, we use it as little possible, so we're only going to use four. I'll show you an example of how we use those. Um, so using the config sets, you can have multiple config sets. We only use one. We call it bootstrap. Um, and then inside those config sets, you use what are called config keys. Config keys basically wrap all the other CloudFormation and NIT resources in there, and you can use them in any way you want. Um, I'll preload before I go into the next set of slides that my examples are only going to show one resource per config key, but that is not the case. You can use as many as you want. It just so happens that they show that way, so I don't want you to be misled that you can only use one resource per config key. That's not, that's not the way it works. So you can see the high-level flow here. We're going to create some files. We're going to install some packages. and uh, We're going to run Chef, and we're going to do a little bit of cleanup. So with create files, we're just going to drop a file on the system. All we're trying to do here is we're trying to tell Chef, hey, I don't even want you to auto-discover. I'm going to tell you right now I'm an EC2 instance. I want you to go out and grab all the metadata you can about this system, because I'm going to use that in my Chef run some way, shape, or form. Then we're going to install some packages. OK, I just need Chef. Give me Chef on the box so I can execute it. From there, we're going to run Chef. OK, so we do a little bit more here. Um, I've pared it down so for readability's sake, so you can see the high-level flow. There's a lot more commands that go into this. Um, the high-level flow is we basically download the Chef repo, we decrypt the repo, we explode it, and then ultimately we run Chef. So what I'll do is I'll just walk you really quickly through what we do when we actually run the last step and we run Chef. So for running Chef, just running the command, we happen to use Chef Solo for our stuff. Um, so we're going to execute that. We're going to pass it the config we want. You can see we're using the override switch. That's the dash O. Um, and we're injecting the role we want it to become. And we're leveraging that CloudFormation uh, parameter. So every instance group, every auto-scaling group that comes up, when those instances come online, because we've injected it this way, they know that they're an app instance. If it's a worker group, they'll know that they're a worker group, because that's the way we tag it with that stack. So everything happens. Uh, the runs go successful. Everything's good. And lastly, do a bit of cleanup. Don't need those artifacts anymore, so get them off the box. Get rid of them. Um, and we're up and running happily. So with all that being said, I think it's only fair that I share with you um, a little bit about um, uh, you know, the future look ahead and what all this means. Essentially, what I've just done is I, I've I've shown you the mountain, and I've given you some tips for climbing that mountain. Uh, but at the end of the day, you guys have to climb that mountain. Um, you know, and unfortunately, you just can't take this stuff, everything I've shown you, go sprinkle it on your AWS accounts, and two weeks later, it's going to be unicorns and rainbows everywhere. Um, now, granted, um, you could definitely start using CloudFormation today, and you should, and you will get benefits. But you, you're only going to get as much out of it as you put into it. And I'm trying to help you or share with you how we did that last leg. Um, because the way it works for us now is I told you how painful operations was um, when we first started. And now 
operations is kind of an afterthought, and I mean that in a really good way. So if I can basically give you a description of what um, uh, tax season looked like for, for our, our group and live community, uh, it was very analogous to being the Maytag repairman. Um, aside, uh, the only difference is we're not that bored dude sitting there drumming our fingers. We got ops and devs all over just doing nothing but coding away and providing extra business value to Intuit. And um, I'm hoping that that's somewhere, a, a place that you all can be someday if you're not there, um, because uh, it's, it's night and day, and it's so refreshing. It's like being this dude on this big, scary hill, and I'm sure that feels fantastic, but that looks scary to me. Um, but anyways, with that being said, um, I'm going to hand it back to Chayton. He is going to talk about um, some of the new features coming in CloudFormation that, uh, that are out there. Um, I know that I'm excited to hear about some of them, because we've been providing feedback on some of these. Um, so thank you very much, and I'll hand it back to Chayton. Thank you. Thank you, Kapan. And uh, in the next few minutes, I'm going to spend uh, time on the new enhancements we have done to the service based on the feedback that we have been receiving from you guys. And whether you are like Kapan, where you're a sophisticated user of CloudFormation, or whether you're using CloudFormation um, as your only tool, these enhancements would be useful to you. When you have to develop and run a stack like this, the responsibility is really twofold. One is that you need to develop the stack just like you would develop an application. And second, you want to make sure that the stack continues to operate going forward. You can make updates to the stack and so on. And I'm going to highlight enhancements we have done both on the development side and the operations side. One of the most Im important enhancements we have done is parallel stack processing. When you are developing a stack, you want to be able to write a single template or a set of templates, create stacks, troubleshoot those, debug those, and iterate on that process again. And you want to be able to do that as fast as possible. And parallel stack processing allows you to do that really, really fast. The reason is, when you provision something like that in CloudFormation, the CloudFormation service automatically figures out what resources can be created in parallel. In this example, there is the, the, there is the database, the S3 bucket, and the load balancers. And all of those resources could be created at the same time. So if I have to provision that stack in CloudFormation today, this is how the timeline would look like. As many as five resources will be created at the same time. And resources like that CloudFront distribution will wait only until its dependencies, the stuff that it depends on, is created. So overall, CloudFormation optimizes the timeline and shrinks it really uh, into really a short timeline compared to what you could do with a regular provisioning script you are still in complete control. So for any reason, if you want to enforce a certain creation order, you can always do that by using a depends on property. You can, if you want to have that ELB created after S3 bucket for any reason, you can always put a depends on property on that ELB to depend on S3 and then S3 will be created first and then the ELB will be created. The parallel operation is in place even when you are deleting the stack or updating the stack. So even those operations are really fast. And it also gives you a benefit of saving cost on resources, because the faster the provisioning, the lesser you are spending on resources. The next couple of features I'm going to highlight help you with writing more reuse reusable and simple templates. Many of, uh, many of you told us that you have use cases where you're, where you're using the same base template, but at the stack creation time, you want to do some fine tuning, like creating a resource or not creating a resource, 
or setting a property or just skipping that property based on that particular environment. And you don't want to maintain multiple copies of basically the same template for these flavors of use cases. And we introduced conditions just for those use cases. To take an example, when the stack is in production, you want to have that multi-AZ database. The re reason is reliability. You want to have a CloudWatch alarm to keep an eye on how much space is left in that database. But when you are developing that stack, you would prefer a stripped down environment. You don't really need a multi-AZ database. You may not want to have that alarm. Does that mean that you have to maintain two separate flavors of the same template for these two things? With conditions, the answer is no. Um, here is how it works. You will specify a parameter called environment. And then using that parameter, you can set and define a condition. And finally, down, where you, when, down in the template, when you're defining the resource, you can use that condition to set whether the, whether the database is multi-AZ or not. And then you can also reuse the condition. So in this example, I want to use a DB snapshot only in production, but I don't want to set that property at all in dev environment. And I can do that using a condition. I can also reuse that condition to create a resource or just completely skip that resource. So in this case, that CloudWatch alarm will be created only in the prod environment and will be completely skipped uh, in the dev environment. You will find the usual suspect functions to make uh, and write more interesting conditions. You can also nest one condition inside another. Moving on, if you have used CloudFormation even at a basic level, you would realize that CloudFormation automatically generates unique name for any resource that it creates. And it does that so that when you create multiple stacks from the same template, there is never a naming conflict. While it's good for avoiding naming conflicts, you have told us that it's difficult to read. A machine-generated name is difficult to read by humans. Um, so we now have a choice for you to provide your own template. Sorry, I think there was some, let's see. Just press the wrong button here. All right. So you now have the, ch the choice of specifying your own name that makes sense to you. You just have to remember that if you're creating multiple stacks from the same template, then you need to make sure that the names that you are providing are unique. Because if otherwise, there will be naming conflict and the clones of the same stack will fail to create. You can set names for several AWS resources, including CloudWatch alarms, S3 buckets, DynamoDB tables, SNS topics, SQS queues, and so on. So far, we looked at the enhancements on the development side. And I'm going to switch gears and look at what we have done on the operations side. Again, a lot of, a lot of you told us that you want a mechanism to make sure that the stacks that you create are well protected from accidental changes. And the next few enhancements focus on that. When you have a team of CloudFormation developers operating in the same account and creating multiple stacks, anybody from that team used to have access to modify any of those stacks. But not st all stacks are created equal. One of the stacks could be a production stack. And you don't want a CloudFormation developer to accidentally delete your production stack. But now you don't have to worry about that uh, eventuality anymore, because there is, a, there is a way to protect that stack. The way you can set that up is this, which is you can create an IAM group for your all CloudFormation users. 
and then give them permission to operate only on a subset of stacks. So in this example, I'm giving write to those users to operate only on those stacks which begin with dev, in short, in the dev environment. So those users cannot touch that production stack that you want to protect. And then I can always create a select group of CloudFormation production users who have access to touch that production stack. This is stack protection, and then there are several ways to achieve stack protection. Um, if you already have a production stack running and you want to protect it, another approach is to deny, have a deny policy. I keep clicking the wrong button in case you're wondering what's happening. So if you already have a production stack, you can also use a deny policy to deny CloudFormation users from touching that production stack. In fact, this is my favorite way, actually, which is embedding that stack protection policy right inside a stacks template. And here I'm passing in the group that I want uh, to be denied access to when I create that stack. And as soon as I create that stack, the group won't be able to delete this stack using stack ID. Stack protection is good, but it's not good enough because you also want to protect resources that are created by the stack. Stack protection is helpful when you want other cloud formation users to not unintentionally change important cloud formation stacks. But how do you protect a cloud formation created resource like an EC2 instance from being deleted by uh, an unknowing EC2 console user, for example? IAM policies is, again, the answer. And then there are several ways to structure those IAM policies. And I'm going to highlight just one new and simple way to do that. I have a group of console users here. And I can set a policy that denies them the right to terminate an EC2 instance if that EC2 instance has a CloudFormation tag. And CloudFormation service automatically tags the resources that it creates. So protecting resources this way is even simpler. Moving on to updates, the IAM policies that we saw are very useful, but they serve a different goal. The goal there is to prevent unintended users from modifying CloudFormation stacks and stack resources. But what if you are an authorized in, uh, intended user of CloudFormation, and you want to do updates, uh, but you want to be absolutely sure that your updates are not going to do something that you did not want to happen? For example, in this stack, this is a real estate website, um, and I may want to update the web servers so that I can keep my UI refreshed for my customers. But I want to be absolutely sure that none of my stack updates are going to touch that database configuration at the back. I can now do that using a new feature called stack policy. I can set a stack policy which says deny any stack update that tries to touch that database while allowing any other type of stack updates. And these policies for controlling stack updates can even be more fine-grained. Uh, so taking another example, let's say you have an EC2 instance, and you want to continue doing software updates on that EC2 instance, but you want to be absolutely sure that none of the updates on that EC2 instance is going to kill that instance and create a new one. You can set a fine-grained policy for that. In this case, I'm saying that deny any update on that stack if that update tries to replace that EC2 instance, but allow any up other update, including a software update on that EC2 instance. And setting stack policies is straightforward. You can use AWS command line or the CloudFormation console to do that, just like you would provide a stack template. And you can set a stack policy while creating the stack 
and also after creating the stack. Thinking more about updates, when you are running a production application, you would want to do software updates, as we have been talking about. But you want to be sure that there is no, there is no downtime for your customers. There are several strategies that people use today in the field. And I'm going to highlight one strategy that we recently added. The, the strategy is to use a relatively new feature that we have added called rolling updates. If I'm updating that web server group, I can update it in a rolling manner. I can specify the minimum number of instances that should be updated, that should be in service at any given time. And then I can divide the entire fleet of instances into small batches and have CloudFormation update only one batch at a time. And I can also have a pause time between two batches. And that time window allows me to react if the updates are not doing what I, what, I'm, what I think they should be doing. So if you find out that the updated software has a bug and you want to abort the update, that time window gives you, gives you an opportunity to cancel stack update and go back to the last known good state of the stack. And the last feature I want to highlight is federation support. If you are a company of many users, you might have specialists like network architects, database admins, and so on. And when you start using AWS, you may not want to create an IAM account for each of them. Instead, what you would do is federation. You would federate those users into AWS and get a temporary security credential for each of those users to access AWS. And you can now also use CloudFormation. Um, you can also have the federated users to use CloudFormation. And the policies could be very fine-grained. If you have the DB admins, you can give them the right to call CloudFormation and data, all the database services and nothing else. For the network admins, you can grant them the right to call CloudFormation and VPC and other networking APIs, but nothing else. And that way, you can manage who, who can do what in your entire infrastructure. IAM roles can also now call CloudFormation. And if, you are, if you're not very familiar with IAM roles, it's a mechanism for, that allows you to avoid using long-term security credentials. It uses temporary security credentials instead. And it also takes care of rotating those credentials. And now you can use the IAM role to use CloudFormation. This is useful for automation. And this is also useful in many other cases. I'm going to highlight just one interesting case, um, which is this, where let's say you have a company and it wants to provision any kind of resource from inside your corporate network. You can now do that using IAM role and CloudFormation. What you would basically do is create an instance in your VPC, have a role on it which has right to call CloudFormation, and then give CloudFormation permissions to use templates inside your corporate network to create stacks inside your corporate network. And all the provisioning is now triggered from inside your network. At the end, I'm just going to, I just want to share some of the related resources with you. First and foremost is, of course, our website to learn more about CloudFormation. If you are new to CloudFormation, we have a Fundamentals of CloudFormation lab right here at reInvent. So I definitely recommend you to go and try that out. And then there are a bunch of other sessions which talk about CloudFormation. With that, I want to thank you again for attending the session. And remember to give us feedback. We have about 10 minutes for questions and answers. And for even more questions, we have CloudFormation engineers uh, available here at the back. So they should be able to talk to you uh, in this room or after we run out of the time outside. Uh, you can find anyone with an uh, orange lanyard, and he will likely be a CloudFormation engineer. But we, for the remaining time, uh, please uh, come near that microphone so your questions are recorded. 
and then we can answer them.